So welcome to the keynote address of this year's EUSR 2023. Um, this is by Robert Santos, the director of US Census Bureau. The talk title is how to be the best statistician or data scientist is not what you think. We have Jantika and Taya from Wesley College as the moderators. So now I'm gonna um, turn the floor to Rob and then also the student moderators. So for any audience, feel free to type your question in the Q&A box and we're gonna monitor them along the way. So I take it away. Yes, my turn. Okay. Yes. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you to the Electronic Undergrad uh, Statistics Research Conference for this invitation. There is absolutely nothing more that I like uh, than addressing uh, students, university students, uh, undergrad, graduate, faculty, whatever, because I'm I'm gonna kind of challenge you to think a little bit differently than maybe you might have before. Thus, the title of my talk, How to Be the Best Statistician or Data Scientist. And it's not what you think, I promise. <laughs> um, and I'm going to start at the end and then uh, by giving you sort of my summary comments. And then I'm going to circle back because what I want you to do is to think about what I'm about to tell you. And you can say, mm, I don't know about this. What's this guy thinking? And then circle back after I tell you a few stories and see if you feel the same way. So, okay, let me start with the end of my talk. What I'm about to tell you is that everything you need to be successful is already inside of you. All, all you have to do is let it out. Uh, in particular, uh, I have found, and I'm passing on these consejos, these wise words from this old man here, to, I'm passing on to you this notion of the value of your whole self, your culture, your values, your life experiences. And yes, the training that you're getting in these excellent universities that you're, you're at and the, the trainings you're getting from your professors, but you need to add all of those together. And when you do, you, you allow yourself to develop unique perspectives based on your life experiences and your culture and your values. And that leads to a level of creativity and innovation that just supercharges your critical thinking. Because after all, and you'll find this both in, in the university, you know, through the learning process, as well as when you get out in your job. You get paid for what you think and how you think. You don't get paid for your credentials. So that's my, that's my finishing line. I'm going to circle back to it later, okay? So right now, what I'm going to do, is I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling. And... I'm gonna I'm gonna do it because you know um, I I don't know if, if my biography was posted or anything, but I happen to have the honor of being uh, the first Latino director of the United States Census Bureau. I wish I wasn't, but it happened to be that way. And when I was asked when I was first nominated or they, they called me up to nominate, they actually, I got a phone call in an afternoon on a weekday and a cell phone. And I, I looked at the cell phone and it literally the caller ID said white house. So that, <laughs> that's how I found out that they were thinking about me. Um, I thought about it, you know, I said, give me some time. And I decided that based on my career, based on who I was, I had something, I had a different perspective to offer as far as the leadership of the largest federal statistical agency in our country. And I thought that that perspective and would add value to the statistical data products that we produce. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about how we uh, I got there. But, you know, and the reason I did that is because I've had like a 40 something year career uh, as a statistician, as a project director, as an executive, you know, C-level, and I've, you know, 
been you know president of the American Statistical Association and the American Association for Public Opinion Research, that type of stuff. So, but I've also been a Latino and I've found myself over the years being uh, the, the sole person of color in a room full of decision makers, uh, who all of whom had their scientists blinders on them. Like, and and I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute. And I found that there was some great value in bringing my whole self perspective to what we were talking about, even though I was the mathematical statistician and all they wanted to know was, uh, do you have, is there enough sample size for the right power to do a statistical test or is the design appropriate? You know, that type of thing. Um, but a little bit of background. I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. I'm a Latino, Mexican-American. Uh, grew up in the barrio uh, in the west side of San Antonio. Went to 12 years of parochial school. Uh, and then uh, went to community college, San Antonio Community College for a semester and then bumped over, uh, transferred over to Trinity University there in San Antonio uh, to get a BA in math. And then I went to grad school at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where I learned the art of statistics, survey sampling, um, survey methodology, and, and so forth. So that was my background. And uh, I found that my love of my uh, culture and the the more I thought about it throughout my training, even my mathematical statistical training, ended up putting me in a different place and thinking about things differently. You know, things in life really, uh, only later in my life did I look back and say, you know, even small little things in my childhood had an impact on who I was as the first Latino director of the Census Bureau, or just really the first director of the Census Bureau for that matter. So the first, actually, I'm gonna give you an illustration of that. The, the first, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. The, the first story I wanna tell is about a mouse, a pecan branch, and a little boy. So, and the little boy's me. So back when I was about six, seven years old, you know, living in, in San Antonio and Barrio, we had this uh, little bungalow, small, it must have been 11, 1200 square foot, three bedroom, but we had seven, you know, seven folks in there. It was all crowded. I, I bunked up with my, my brother. And, uh, you know, back in those days, you know, the bungalows were, were kind of loosely built. And even in the fall, it would get pretty cold because it was all drafty. Even though we had these uh, natural gas <laughs> heaters and you would think, oh my God, you know, there's, you know, carbon monoxide, but no, there never was a problem because the place was so drafty. So um, one night I was sleeping, it was cold. I was way under my covers. I was sound asleep on my back and I got startled awake. And what happened is that a little mouse decided to visit me because the house, you know, the, the mice liked the warmth in the house or what little there was. And so they, they had, one had crawled up the bedpost and then gotten onto my bed and then started, I was on my back and started at my feet and running alongside, you know, my body. And I could, I could feel that something was going on. And then the critter ended up, you know, right around right here and then went across my, my chest on, my, on the covers and then ran in spurts back. And I just totally freaked out. So I screeched and I, you know, bolted out and woke up everybody in the household, ran down to the end of the house screaming. And uh, everybody was really annoyed. It was about like two in the morning. Uh, and they was just saying, get back to bed. And I was saying, no, there's mice, you know, attacking me. And they went and looked and there was nothing there. So they, they put me back in bed and I suffered through the night. And the problem was that for the next several days, I, could, I, would, I wouldn't want to go to bed because there was going to be a repeat performance. I knew it. And so I, um, you know, they were having trouble with me. I was having trouble with them, frankly, you know, my parents and, and my, my brothers and sisters. 
And the then one day I was I was there in the house in the afternoon and in walks my my grandmother, my abuelita. And uh, she had come to visit and she walked in and I went to go meet her and she didn't say a word. She just looked at me and then she looks up and then walks out to the back door and out the back door. I'm like, okay, what's going on? The little kid, you know. So I run over, I peek through the through the blinds and there she is reaching up and grabbing a little pecan branch from the branch of the tree. It was still fall, so there was some leaves on it. And she took off a little length about this long, with, you know, leaves and a couple of pecans and stuff. But it, you know, kept it in her hand and walked back into the house. And then she, I was there, I was looking like, okay, what's going on? She looked at me up and down again. And then she said, get to the bed. And she said it in Spanish, because that's that's all she spoke. So I, I went to the bed, the dreaded bed that I didn't want to go to sleep in. And I lay, she said, lay down. And then she said, shut up, <laughs> don't see a thing. So I was there laying with my eyes wide shut. And it was like, okay, what, what is going on? And then suddenly I heard some whispers. And then I felt the pecan branch sort of going down, brushing my body like that. And it hit me then that she was doing a prayer. And we call it in the Mexican culture, the asusta blessing. Asusta means fear. So she was basically administering a blessing to take away the trauma that I had experienced by being with this, this little critter, this furry critter, the mouse. Um, so she went like that for a few minutes and then she, it was over and she said, get up, go. And I just jumped up and ran out, you know, five, six or six, seven year old kid. Didn't think about it. Just went about my business. But the most amazing thing happened. I ended up no longer having a fear that a mouse was going to come to get me. I, I promise. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It just happened. And so from then on, I, I went to bed without a problem, didn't worry about the mice, didn't worry about nothing. And to this day, they don't scare me. Where, whereas, you know, as a little kid, it was like the worst thing in the world. Um, and it wasn't until years later that I thought, you know what? My grandmother was just doing she was living her life. She was living her culture. She was living her values. Everything that she learned when she grew up in northern Mexico, in the in the town of Paras de la Fuente, in Co the state of Coahuila, in northern Mexico, before she came over because of the Mexican Revolution and such. If, you know, there was a big refugee population, and my four grandparents were part of it. She was just living her life and living her culture, living her values. And it occurred to me that that later in life, that that one incident upon reflection actually impacted me in how I approach all things statistical and uh, all things research, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, and even things like um, management decisions and et cetera. Uh, because there's two things in the world that I that from a career perspective drive me, and one is statistics, and the other is helping people. And the helping people is really part of that, you know, the cultural thing that she gave to me through showing me how she used all the tools and levers at her disposal based on her culture, ex life experience, etc., to help me as a little kid, you know, her her nieto. Um, to overcome the trauma that I had experienced. Um, and I've, I've, thought, I've used that a lot in life. And I'll bet you that if you look back on your life, there are, if with enough self-reflection, you will find similar things um, that affect you and who you are and how you're learning and how you're interpreting uh, results or 
forming questions, be they research questions or even questions in everyday life. Like, why did you do this? You know. Um, so that's my that's the first story that I wanted to sort of pique your interest with. I, I hope it did. Um, but the first time it really manifested this whole experience and how I used my culture was um, was when I was, let's see, it was in 95, so 99 from five, it was, I was 40 something years old. And I had, I was appointed to a study section for the Agency for Health Research Quality um, in the federal government. And uh, you, you may know this by now uh, as undergrads, but most research professors in, in faculty and such, they get research by applying to grants. And, to, and often, more often than not, it's to a federal agency. And they say, here's my proposal, here's my justification, uh, lit review, here's what I'm gonna do, analysis, data gathering, et cetera. And then those get submitted to a study section, which is composed, uh, this one was about 20 people. Uh, and we score them. And based on the scores, the top, you know, the top per small percentile end up getting uh, getting funded. And the others, they have to come back for another day. So I was, uh, you know, I was like my second or third year into the study section. I ended up doing two terms, six years. And um, there was this one, you know, health, health, you know, research. It was like health quality research. So there was this one really interesting proposal. I hadn't been assigned to review it, but, you know, everybody got to weigh in after there was a primary review or a secondary review, actually much like uh, editor editorial boards and in, in journals and such. So um, it was a project that at the time, this was before the Affordable Care Act, where there's this open open market and you can get health insurance, that type of thing. It was before that was available. So there was a ton of people who did not have health care and what that or health insurance. And what that did is it it meant that when people presented at eight in in emergency rooms or or clinics, the those facilities were obliged to, to treat the patients. And if they couldn't afford it, then they were taking a financial hit. And they didn't want to do that, obviously. And so a researcher said, hey, you know, here's a chronic condition. I, I think it was like chronic pain uh, where there are, I think we can develop an inexpensive therapy to address that for folks that don't have health insurance. Let's help them out, right? And at the same time, if we can help them out, then the, the ERs and the clinics aren't gonna be taking a financial hit. It's a win-win situation, right? And so what they, what they did is that they had this amazing statistical design. The research question on the face value was, you know, win-win, let's help out the, the health industry and let's help out the, the people. We'll have, we'll have an alternative therapy. Great statistical design, great literature review, great data collection plan. It was going to be a, an experimental design, clinical trial type of thing, where half the people without, without insurance would uh, go through the regular stuff, regular uh, conventional therapies, and the uh, financial institutions would take a hit. And the other random half would be assigned an alternative therapy, which involved transcendental meditation to deal with chronic pain. Um, statistical power was great. Analyses, you know, the way they set up the hypotheses and the, the analysis plan was exceptional. The power was great. Sample size and all that. And um, these, you know, I was the sole person of color in a room full of decision makers. And Everybody loved it there. They were like, man, this, and I have to admit, it was a spectacular design. Stati from the statistical perspective, it was flawless. So, um, but it bothered me. It, it, it really bothered me. Um, so everybody was talking, talking it up and saying, man, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they said, well, are there any comments before we vote? And 
then I finally decided I was going to speak up. So uh, this was like the first time I had ever done this. So I was really scared that they were going to say that they were going to like just ignore me, that type of thing. And plus, it's amazing. I was on a study section giving out millions of dollars and evaluating. I was the only mass person with a master's degree there. Everybody else were these big time research MDs, PhDs, et cetera. They were like the leading scientists in the field. And for whatever reason, they had decided that they needed a statistician, me, on their, on their study section. So I, I kind of like raised my hand a little bit and I said, excuse me, can I say something? Uh, and it was really tough. I actually, you know, I got emotional when I started talking. And they say, you know, basically, what do you have to say? And I said, well, I said, I think that if you fund this grant application as it's currently written, that we that uh, it's going to do inherent damage. So I believe we should not fund this as it's currently written. And they said, what are, what's wrong? Haven't you been listening? You know, tell us why. And I said, because it's the framing of the problem. Here you go. We're going to create an alternative therapy for people without health insurance because they can't afford it. So if you have health insurance, step over to door number one. We're going to give you the best meds, the best docs, the best treatments for your chronic pain. Oh, you, you don't have health insurance? Step over to door number two. And we'll, we're going to help you think through your pain. And it's not going to cost us a dime. I said, if we, if we go that route, we will be promoting a two-tier health system. One for the haves, you have health insurance, and one for the have-nots, you don't have it. And I said, if it's really a good therapy, it needs to be open to everybody. There's plenty of people with health insurance that don't like taking meds. And they would love a therapy like that. So I say, don't fund this as written, regardless of the strengths, the scientific strength of, of the design, the statistical approach, et cetera. And instead go back and say, rewrite this thing for everybody and then come back to us. And then I just, I stood back and I waited and I was getting ready for the sort of the daggers and the attacks to come. But they listened and they ended up saying, you know what, we agree with you. And so they sent it back. And uh, I don't know whether it ever came in because by that time I was, I rotated off. But it, it showed me that here I was, I was a sampling statistician. I knew my a generic statistician too. I was a mathematical uh, statistician. That's, that's how I started in grad school. And it, here I was, I was using my whole self to think, to do some critical thinking about a research problem. And it offered a perspective that was based on my life experience, my culture, my values, and my statistical training. Because my statistical training said it was great. It's just that the other three, there were issues <laughs> with the other stuff. And to me, that made me a more powerful statistician so that rather than somebody simply saying, just tell me what sample size I need, they had to listen to why I thought that there were some real issues. They, you know, the critical thinking, like I was saying earlier, it's, they pay you for what you think and how you think. And I was bringing something to the table nobody else there had. To me, that was really powerful and it motivated me towards a life journey of continuing that process of using my culture, my values, et cetera. So the, the next story is about my Brazilian adventure. So I was, uh, I was at the National Opinion Research Center, University of Chicago, and I was a vice president for statistics and methodology there. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a survey shop and a research shop. 
And, you know, once in a while, you know, the, the research centers, they get calls from folks and they say, hey, we want to we want to give you money to do a, a, a study, a research study. And so apparently a call had come in from the Brazilian government to NRC and they said, we want to give you guys half a million dollars to do a survey in the U.S., so, you know, come down to the embassy in Washington, D.C. This is, we, we, we were in Chicago then. Come down to the embassy so that we can, we can do that. So nobody wanted to go. <laughs> it was like, hey, man, you know, go down to D.C., check out the Brazilian embassy. Uh, so they said, Rob, you know, you go. And I said, fine, whatever. So I jump on a plane, get out, go, go down Embassy Row in Washington, D.C., and bam, there's this absolutely gorgeous building, you know, sort of modern art type of thing, architecture, and it's the Brazilian embassy. So they drop, I get dropped off by the cab, I walk in, all formal, right? So, you know, you're there at the embassy, they say, oh, the minister will be seeing you in a minute, uh, and then they lead me into this this beautifully decorated room. They sit me down, you know, with, at a couch with a coffee table. The minister comes in. Finally, we say our our hellos and such, and sit down, and we have tea and chit chat a little. And then he says, "Well, the reason we called you down here is because we want a good, you know, scientific organization." to do a national survey of the American public to find out what they know about the Brazilian economy and why, you know, why they don't appreciate it. Because, you know, the, at that time, the Brazilian con economy was like the fifth largest in the world. It was even larger than the USSR at the time, you know, that type of thing. So why aren't people appreciating this more? And, you know, here I was, I was sitting down with the minister from the government of Brazil with the basically, in a, not in his pocket, but figuratively in his pocket, a half million dollar check saying, I want you to do some, this research, right? A lot of people would have said, fine, give me the check. You know, let's, let's get going. I couldn't do that. I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't. So I say, look, you know, I, I understand that there's a need, you need to have this information and, and you wanna understand what's going on with US citizens and why they don't appreciate the, the Brazilian economy. I said, but you don't need a survey for that. I promise you, I can tell you right now what the results of the survey would be. Nobody, almost nobody in the U.S. appreciates or knows about the Brazilian economy. Heck, we don't even know who our you know, first president is half the time. <laughs> uh, I said, so maybe it might be better to rethink what it is you're trying to get out of that survey. And it most likely will be to understand how different types of people or sectors in, in, our, in the U.S., think about other countries, including Brazil, and what things might motivate them to appreciate and, you know, uh, the, the value that your economy is bringing to the U.S. and vice versa. And so maybe going up to Boston and the Northeast where there are enclaves of Brazilians, those folks very much know about Brazil, and they, you know, because they're Brazilian, Brazilian immigrants, so maybe you can start there and then go over to this other, other you know, seg basically segmentation of the populations, this other segment and learn other things from them doing qualitative research. So, so it's not like you're going to, you don't need a point estimate for these types of things. You just need an understanding of what the issues are. And then from that, you can decide whether or not you really can or should have a survey and want to pour that amount of money in. But by that time, you'll have some really good objectives that are quantitatively oriented that you could then bring to. Them. He was really disappointed, uh, but to me, it was the absolute right thing to do. You don't take the money of someone who doesn't realize that what they're asking for isn't what they need. You instead talk to them and get them to realize the bigger picture. And so 
that's another instance of using your values. I, I used my ethics, ethics value and my culture to, to, get, to help people, to do the two things that I like most, statistics and helping people, to get them to understand that there are better, better ways and then to preserve my own self-dignity so I can wake up every morning and look in the mirror and know that when I do research, I'm doing it for the betterment of society, not just to take somebody's paycheck or check. So that was my second, my Brazilian adventure. And there, the last story I want to tell is about my newsletter epiphany. So this is, this is an interesting story. Um, you know, as part of the AHRQ, uh, uh, being in a study section and making decisions on, on grant applications and such, you know, I would get like these government, uh, federal government newsletters, like from NIH and National Cancer Institute, et cetera, that would highlight the research that they're doing. And this was back in the in the late 90s, right? So here you are in the late 90s. I'm, I'm getting these newsletters and I was just like perusing it and bam, it hit me. Oh, geez, look at this. And there was a research study that they were that they were doing that said, Oh, look, look at what we did. We went to clinics and did a study and we found that it, it was a study of Spanish speaking clients, patients that were coming into the clinic. And here was the finding. The finding was that if the staff of the clinic, be it the clerks or the administrators or the physicians or the nurses or whatever, if any of the staff knew just a little bit of Spanish, then their health, then the outcomes of those patients, Spanish speaking patients, were better than the outcomes of Spanish speaking patients when nobody knew Spanish. This was back in the days of you know English, English only type of thing. And Honestly, I read it and I burst out laughing. Like, give me a, uh, a break. <laughs> and um, I said, do you really need, to myself, I said, do you really need a study to show you that if you understand instructions, you're going to have better outcomes than if you don't understand instructions? <laughs> You do, you, honestly, you don't. Right? There's some things that you don't have to do a, a, a clinical trial on in order to, to find out. <laughs> um, and then I had my epiphany. So my epiphany was this. This was the first time I'd ever seen the federal government fund a study where the health insurance industry was acculturating to a more diverse population. I'd never seen that before. I still, I still get emotional thinking about it. I'm sorry. Um, and it, it, it really hit me. Uh, that is an incredibly big deal. Up to that point, we in the research industry didn't care and didn't act as if people within other languages and other cultures really mattered. I mean, back in the old days, my, my first national study was the National Chicano Study, we called it. People of Mexican American descent, national study. First time ever out of the Survey Research Center, University of Michigan. I was a grad student there. And uh, we had a, a cohort of, of Latino students and we got together and we said, let's, you know, they were going to translate these common, you know, the, the standard questions for, you know, health and for mental health and this and that. And one of the questions was, was about depression. Uh, how much in the last month have you felt sad and blue? We'll try translating that into Spanish. It doesn't make any sense because pe people in Spanish don't relate to depression as being blue. <laughs> um, so so it, it, it kind of, it really, it really, really impacted me genuinely that finally our society was recognizing the beautiful diversity 
that we've we are expanding into. We're becoming more and more diverse each year. As I can say that as the director of the Census Bureau. And um, it's time to, to think about programs that don't say, here you are the individual and here's what you need to do to get better treatment or to get a better outcome. And rather think about it's the, the outcomes of, the, of people are the fundamental product of the interaction of individuals and society and institutions. So it's not necessarily the only way to solve the problem is to just look at one side of the equation. You need to look at the other two. Um, so th that was great. And here we are 30 years or 40 years, however many years later. And uh, honestly, we're still struggling with the acculturation of our society to adapt to a more diverse population, but it's much better and people accept it. It's just that way back then it was tough. It was really, really tough to try to get that message across because nobody was listening, but it was so heartwarming to see that. And it's actually part of the, I, I ended, uh, you know, the, the, my last story was about that just specifically because everyone here listening to me it's your responsibility too, to think about how you, through your learning and your research in statistics or data science or whatever you end up doing, it doesn't have to even be that. It can be fill in the blank, whatever career path you take. You have, um, you can do good, not only by helping others help themselves, but by helping the institution and the organization adapt to this more diverse society. Um, so that was my acculturation epiphany. <laughs> um, so, so I guess I'll, I'll wrap up at this point. Yes, you are undergraduates. You guys are doing some amazing stuff, amazing research. I just saw little snippets uh, coming in uh, a little bit early and congratulations. You're doing some great stuff. Learn your trade, learn your methods, learn your programming, uh, learn some data science, learn some coding, do all of that high tech technical training. But the biggest value is going to be learning yourself and letting yourself out because all of the success that you're ever going to have is from deep inside of you. And when you bring your whole self to the table, you create that unique perspective that no one else can possibly have because no one has your life experience. Um, so take that deep, deep perspective, bring your whole self, mix it up with your training, all your technical training, and you will have amazing critical thinking in a way nobody else has because it's it's all yours. Uh, it will lead to creativity, innovation. People will want and seek out your thinking. So don't bother asking, what would my professor think? You need to ask, what would I think? Okay? Because you get paid for what you think and how you think. You don't get paid for your credentials. And with that, I'll stop and take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Santos. That was, was lovely to hear your different stories um, and certainly the takeaways too. Um, before we get into the Q&A session, we want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors, um, the American Statistical Association, the Consortium for the Advancement of Undergraduate Statistics Education, and the ASA section on statistics and data science education. So thank, thank you. you for supporting this. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Jontika to start the question. Yeah, um, just a reminder for the audience members, you can send us questions through the Q&A chat um, on the Zoom. Um, again, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I guess our first question is what you mentioned that the U.S. is increasingly getting more diverse, um, and we also know that we're in an increasingly data-driven world. I'd love to hear about like your vision and goals, whether short-term and long-term, about like the U.S. Census Bureau and mm -hmm. other data collection agencies in terms of like 
data accuracy, diversity, things like that. Oh, yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, as I told you, uh, I came to the Census Bureau because I knew that the perspective that I've just espoused to you, that's what I'm doing internally as well. I mean, I've had some amazing conversations with people um, to to try to get people to think differently. And when you when you take sort of uh, what I call an equity lens to um, to everything you do, uh, you will you will soon recognize that things that we take for granted that are absolutely gold standard, we have an obligation to revisit. So for example, we do a, uh, for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we do something called the uh, current population survey. It's like has the leading economic indicators of our nation, you know, unemployment, they track uh, average uh, wages, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, CPI comes from there. Um, and it, uh, it turns out that there, there, and in many of our other surveys, like the American Community Survey, or rich treasure trove type of thing, we ask a simple question. How much did you make last month? So guess when, uh, I, I don't know when the question was first drafted, but I can guess that it was probably in the 50s or 60s or 70s or something like that. It's like, it was like way back. Back then, what was society like? Well, most people, if they were working, they had a regular job. They had weekly or biweekly or monthly paychecks. Fast forward half a century, where are we now? We got gig work. We have maybe 40% of our population has multiple jobs, has episodic work, does even barter stuff just to make ends meet. So when you have that large of a population with episodic and irregular uh, sources of income coming in, then suddenly a question like, what did you make last month becomes really challenging. Do we have, we're, have we changed our methods? You know, it could very well be. We should be saying, uh, do you get monthly, do you get regular paychecks? Yes. Okay. What did you make last month? And that type of thing. And do you, do you get regular paychecks? No. Well, you know, tell me about this work situations and then go down a path that allows them to more cognitively in a cognitively less burdensome fashion, um, use anchors and recall so that they can report for whatever an appropriate period of time is sort of their, their gig work and report some of their episodic employment and other sources of income because things like SNAP, they end, <laughs> TANF, you know, it comes and goes and things of that sort and make it much more easier. We're not doing that. We're just saying, tell me your monthly income. Um, that means that, so I'm challenging folks to, to, to think about how society has changed and think about what that means for every single question we ask on every single survey and census that we do that, that compels us to maybe re-look, re-examine how we can better approach that, or maybe there are different measures or constructs that we should be using and things of that sort. That's one thing. The second is that, and uh, a lot of this stuff, like uh, truth, truth in, in, in kind of advertising type of thing, Census Bureau already does some of that. Uh, what I'm trying to do is be more deliberate uh, because we tend to look at things overall, like it, how's it looking overall, rather than saying the world is made up in terms of the folks that are, where it's easy to respond and folks where it's hard. And maybe we should be looking at, at it from that lens rather than overall, it doesn't make that much of a difference. So let's just keep going. Um, so we're doing that. The other thing we're doing is that is this whole issue of, of data equity. Um, and we're taking a look at uh, not just our standard data products, you know, tables and you know, data sets and microdata, which are incredibly valuable, but also thinking about how can we create more, more relevant data for local communities. And so we've, we've gone on a journey of creating more data visualizations. So there are things like um, uh, 
any economists out there, uh, we have something called the Census Business Builder. And it's a really cool app that starts with the nation. And then you can go down to, you know, state or county or city, down to the census track level. And it, what's nice about it is it combines data from the American Community Survey, so it's rich socioeconomic data, with economic data. Businesses, what are the industries there? Uh, you know, what, what type, is it retail? Is it you know, this or that or whatever? And it can be used for people who are thinking of, you know, like, you know, Micron wants to put in a, a, a plant in, in central New York. Do, um, what's the labor base going to be like? They can use that to take a look at that. Are there, uh, will we have problems with supply chains for some of the stuff we need? It'll take a look at that general area and say, who are there, are there suppliers? Who are they? You know, not who are they, but, you know, what's the volume of sales and, and that type of thing? So that they can get a sense of whether they, that's going to be a big issue or not. Uh, they can look at the la potential labor pools and look at what's the average uh, education of the employed or the unemployed and things of that sort. So like really, really nice thing for the business builder. There's the community resilience estimates, which uh, basically is in partnership with FEMA and DHS and others that uh, superimposes natural disaster data like wildfires, hurricanes, uh, floods, uh, tornado damage, you know, things of that sort on top of, um, of risk of socioeconomic data, but especially as it relates to specific risk factors. So there's some risk scores and it's a data visualization. You can go down to the census tract level. Uh, there are 10 risks, things like what percentage of the population has broadband? What percentage of the population has uh, relies on public transportation? What percentage of the population is non-English speaking? What percentage of the population is uh, chronic has chronic conditions? And it'll kick off if you're above a, th a threshold what the risk factors are. And if you have three or more, then you're targeted as your higher risk for being able to recover from or uh, address a natural disaster. And it's great because then you can look at communities and find out where the pockets are and that can help in emergency planning and the Red Cross and the you know fire stations and this and that. Uh, really, really useful tool. But if you think about it, Okay, poverty, broadband, health insurance, um, uh, things of that, you know, unemployment, those are some of the risk factors. Those are also something that you will learn if you end up being in sort of more social scientists. They're the social determinants of health and wealth and other, other types of things. You can leverage that data to do some really amazing work. So uh, data visualizations like that. So we're both, we're combating, uh, and challenging ourselves to uh, to create new data visualization products. We're questioning the data we are gathering to see how we can and should adapt to a more diverse society. And because diversity is in much more different ways, not just uh, race and ethnicity or language, but also in terms of employment situations, that type of thing. Um, so we're doing those types of things. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I, I definitely am curious to look at some of that data. Um, we have a couple questions in the Q&A feature um, about uh, continuing on the census note. So one of them is what changes do you think could be made to the US census in order to more accurately reflect the ethnic racial makeup of the US? Uh, to the US census. Well, um, it doesn't say US Census Bureau. So I guess I'll stick to the decennial census. Um, so, okay, let me talk about that. We are currently in the midst of going through a, um, a revision of the standards for collecting race and, and ethnicity. Um, it is not the Census Bureau's job to make that determination. Interestingly, it's the determination of the something called the Office of Management and Budget, which not many people realize is part of the White House. It's the administration. And um, the last time a revision was made to that was 1997. And even back then, 
that 1997, which literally is the current version we're working on right now, um, took, a, took a paradigm of a non-diverse country. So uh, here's an easy example. Back in the 50s and 60s, all you had to do was ask it, are you black or not? Or are you African-American or not? Why? Because like 99 plus percent of the black population in the US were descendants of uh, ultimately slaves or black people from, uh, from way back. Fast forward to you know, the, the, the new millennia and we've got, gotten real significant influxes of black populations from Somalia, Nigeria, Ethiopia, etc. And now it's insufficient simply to ask if you're black or not, if you want to understand the true diversity of our of our beautiful country and our beautiful diversity of our nation, we need to be disaggregating and finding out more information. The same applies for the Middle Eastern and uh, MENA, Northern African uh, peoples. The same applies for Asian people. The same applies for for Latinos even. I mean, there's the whole issue of uh, Afro-Latinos and, and things of that sort. So uh, we're, we're going through the process and expect that OMB will come down with the decision uh, the end of, uh, or the middle of next year. However, we, um, we were at the table. So we co-chaired the working group that came up with the recommendation that OMB is looking at. So we were able to leverage a lot of the research we had already done and our subject matter expertise because we got some of the best. Uh, and, uh, and so we're really hopeful that we're going to come up with a solution uh, that will allow for a 2030 census to really show all the brilliant colors and aspects of our, of our wonderful population. Awesome. Yeah. I think another question that we have in the chat um, is also about like ethnic and racial makeup. It asks, do you see a future where we deconstruct reductive and historically marginalizing racial and ethnic categories to measure more realistic racial and ethnic identities? Uh, the quick answer is, I don't know. Um, I have, I've described a process by which the Office of Management and Budget is going to make a decision with our input and the input of all the other federal statistical agencies, for that matter, um, to, uh, we fully expect it will capture in a much, much more diverse way the, the breadth of the race, ethnicity, and the mixtures, you know, multi-race and multi-ethnic and multi-racial ethnic diversity of our, of our population. Uh, we actually got a hint of that with the 2020 census because we did a little bit of a workaround and you should take a look at this. It's called the DHCA, the Detailed Demographic and Housing Characteristics File A. And what we did is we asked the 1997 question, you know, white, black, you know, that type of thing. But after each racial category, according to the 1997 version, because we were obliged to do that, we put in a blank line that you could write in and we said, and what else? And people wrote in, what else? And then we captured much more information, many more characters than we had in the past. So this DHC file A has over 370 uh, combinations of race and ethnicity that you can look at and and are tabulated, you know, all at various levels of geography by age and sex and race. Uh, so take a look at that if you have time. It's it really shows the diversity of our country. Uh, and uh, come coming up in the in the future, that will be more standardized. So you don't have to necessarily have this blank in in all of those. Uh, things. The, the, to me, the biggest challenge is that um, you as university students, you are the college, you are the scholars and intellectuals of our future. But let's be real. I'm, uh, I'm a statistician, but I'm also a very realistic type of researcher. People don't, un the public does not understand the difference between race and ethnicity. The scholars understand the difference between, and they will argue it till their heads explode, till our heads, I'm part of that, till our heads explode. Um, 
But at the end of the day, people need to be able to tell their stories. And so what we need to do in my vision is come up with a way of asking a question about race and ethnicity so that people are allowed to tell the story in the way that makes sense to them because that's the way you know, we pick up self-report. We don't ask you to you know, prove by DNA or anything. We just say, tell us who you, who you believe you are to be. Um, and then once we capture that rich information, it's incumbent upon us to then just decide how do we combine it to make distinctions between the scholarly uh, aspects of race or ethnicity or race ethnicity or multi that type of thing. By the way, I see my good friend, Sam Echeverria Cruz and hello, Sam. I know you can't talk, but <laughs> just wanted to say, hey, I saw your name and my eyes brightened up. <laughs> Um, I think we have time for one quick final question. Um, the last one in the chat is from um, Patra. Um, and they ask, kind of, we've heard a lot about personally what you have brought to the table um, on the non-technical side. This person asks, what has been the most useful technical skill in the course of your career? Okay, so uh, please, yeah, it's nice to think about the decomposition of of discussions into technical and not non-technical, but to me, you can't separate them. Life is interconnected. I promise you that if you think something's only technical, think again, they're all interconnected. We just had a conversation on race and ethnicity and the complexities, complex, complexities of that inner society. The numbers aren't gonna matter. If, if people don't understand the concepts, they are, everything is intertwined. And, and when you start looking at it that way, you'll develop a richer ability to gain insights and direct your own research into gathering better data, more relevant data and advancing the knowledge. So having said that, okay, what was the, um, what was the uh, question? <laughs> I, I just wanted to jump in on that first. <laughs> Oh, the question was, what was the most uh, useful technical skill in oh. the course of your career? Okay, it, uh, you're going to laugh because, because, like I said, everything's interconnected. So my most valuable, by far, educational experience was being on the Agency for Health Quality Research Study Section. So I had learned all my statistics. It was great. I learned from some of the best. It was one of the founders of survey sampling, Leslie Kish. Um, but getting into that room of diverse, and diverse, I mean, different, like some people studied medicine, some people studied social work, some, you know, et cetera, diverse experts and learning how they think about research in terms of conceptual frameworks, logic models for programs, uh, the life course of evaluations and how you shouldn't start with an outcomes evaluation. You need to let it percolate and, and mature before you get to the end. Um, those types of things were enormously, uh, it, it was technical. I mean, I, uh, I was reading uh, articles that ended up taking me into social psychology and behavioral science and this and that, um, and learning about these conceptual frameworks that just, it made everything, it, it made this notion that everything's connected uh, come to life because I, I saw it in front of my eyes. And then I used that to then go into public policy research where I, I preached the same thing that I did here. Thank you. That um, concludes the keynote address. Thank you again so much, uh, Mr. Santos for sharing so in depth about your life stories and your career together. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Um, we'll hand it off to the graduate school information. Thank session. you, everyone. Labor love. Do the same, please. Labor love.